the candidates have participated in a draw to determine the order in which they'll appear on the stage. I'll call them up in that order and ask them to move to the appropriate podium starting from the audience's left. First, Mr. John Tory. Second, Ms. Olivia Chow. And Mr. Ryan Doyle, uh, thank you. Please join us as moderator. Thank you very much for having agreed to moderate today's event. Over to you. Good afternoon to the both of you. Good afternoon to everybody in the audience this afternoon. The debate format is pretty straightforward. Both candidates have drawn, and John Tory will receive the first question. Following that, Ms. Chow will get a rebuttal to that question, and then both candidates will debate the issue on hand for two minutes. Also, as part of the draw, Ms. Chow uh, got the first closing argument, so she will make her closing statement later on when we are set to conclude. Uh, as I mentioned, each candidate gets two minutes. I hope that both of you will respect that, and away we go. Mr. Tory, the first question is to you. Most job creation comes from economic growth, and mayors have very little power over that. Even prime ministers and premiers overinflate their influence over the business cycle, and they have far more power than mayors. Let, yet this campaign has been filled with job promises. Are these false promises, or do you truly feel you can deliver? If so, how? Well, Ryan, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, having us here today. I'm sorry we have one uh, colleague missing, but I, I think a mayor has a lot to do. Uh, with attracting jobs and investment to the city. Not so much creating the jobs, but attracting jobs and investment to the city. Uh, and I think one of the problems of the last four years of division and, and, uh, and that kind of thing has been that our reputation has suffered and that it has distracted the mayor and others on the city council from one of their most fundamental tasks, which is to attract jobs and investment to this city. And I hope one of the things people will focus on uh, as we uh, enter the last weeks of the campaign is which candidate do they think is going to be best able to understand the kinds of decisions that businesses are going to make uh, from Alberta or from 905 or from Arkansas or China or India uh, when they're looking around the world at the different places they could invest and create jobs. Now, what can we do about it here? There's a very definite role beyond being what I view the mayor's job as uh, to be, which is the chief ambassador and chief salesperson. First of all, I think we have to consolidate our uh, efforts and our organizations within the city. We have a patchwork quilt of organizations that are out trying to attract jobs and make this a, an attractive place for people to do business. Secondly, I think we need much more federal, uh, provincial, and regional cooperation. It's city regions that are often competing for these jobs now more so than uh, cities or towns themselves. I have put forward something called a one jobs plan which uses some of the tax tools we do have in our somewhat limited arsenal to actually create jobs, say for example around the Scarborough subway where Scarborough uh, hasn't had its fair share of jobs. They're more attracted to downtown oftentimes and I think it's time we tried to do things to encourage people, uh, startups and other kinds of businesses to locate uh, around the city. I think we have to look at the regulatory burden, and I've made a pledge to reduce that regulatory burden in a targeted way so that we can make it simpler for people to do business with the city. We have to look at taxes and continue to make sure this is a favorable place uh, for business uh, to be located from the standpoint of taxes, and I would continue with the program that has started to uh, take a little bit, a bit of the burden off of business in terms of our taxes, and finally, build transit, which connects people to jobs. Ms. Chow. Ms. Chow, the same question to you. Yeah. I believe the city government has a role to play in three areas. Number one, we can create jobs by making use of our capital budget. When we are investing in uh, infrastructure, for example, we can leverage that money and say to the big corporations that are actually doing businesses with the city of Toronto that they would sign a community benefits agreement any big contracts that are over $50 million. And that, together, we can create 5,000 jobs in the next four years. This has been done extensively in the States, this community benefits agreement um, methodology. It's been done in Vancouver, when they built the Olympic Village, where they created a lot of local jobs. And it's been done in the city of Toronto, when Regent Park got revitalized, 500 jobs were created for young people and for uh, and, and some apprenticeship programs there too. Number two, in terms of how we can create jobs, is that we can sell the city a lot better. 
Right now, when we promote ourselves outside this country, we speak in very, very many different voices. I plan to bring everyone together, form an agency called Global Toronto, where the uh, Toronto Economic Development Division and Investment Toronto would come together, together with the Toronto Region Board of Trade, uh, the Service Alliance and uh, the Financial Services Alliance and different GTA mayors. We can come together and sell Toronto with one voice. I, did, I saw that happening in Vancouver when I represented the city, uh, Canada, in Beijing, and I saw how the Vancouver mayor did it. We can do that too. And thirdly, we can keep property tax low for small businesses, cut red tape for them, help small businesses uh, flourish, especially when it comes to newcomers, they can start their business a lot easier, and that would create jobs also. Now I'm going to give the, the, the opportunity for the two of you to debate that issue. Well, Mr. Tory, um, I would love to see an actual commitment of the number of jobs that you would want to create. It's important to create a target, because if you don't have a target, it's hard to say that, you know, in four years' time, I would be able to support a certain way. Would you actually support the Community Benefits Agreement, which is happening in Alexander Park now, for example, with the uh, Tridel Corporation? It's something that's proven to work. Would you join with me and say that, yes, this is a good plan, and yes, we can create some jobs, especially well, for well, young people? Let me just say two things. First of all, you measure these things uh, by virtue of the jobs that the government itself uh, is going to mandate to be created or the government itself is going to create. I look at it a bit differently, and I look at that as a part of it. And you know that I've said, for example, that the City of Toronto's leading youth employment program, I will double the number of companies, not in four years, in one year, that participate in that program. And that, of course, will dramatically increase by hundreds of positions each year, the number of kids that are helped by that program. But, you see, I'm looking at this a little differently than you are. I'm looking at this as something we have to do to attract new people to come here from around the world and from around the country and from around the region. And I think the big stifling hand of government that you're going to lay on a lot of things in order to try and get that done is actually going to have a counterproductive effect. I think we have to make this an attractive place to do business. And I think a lot of the stuff you talk about is going to cause people to pause and say, I'm just not so sure. I want to go down there and get involved with more and more of these kinds of programs you have that involve more people, filling out more papers, Mr. Mr. and Tory, accounting to more government Allow me to just, uh, just hang on a second. So you're saying that you would not support what Metrolink is doing what Daniel Corporation is doing, what Tridel is doing, I, because allow no, me to finish with, let, uh, with that. Okay. You are going to cancel all of these no. very successful models, no, but I'm you not. don't want to see it but happening. But you see the difference because between you and no, me. Let, let all right, well, you, the clock so has got nine seconds me left, to, so if you well, want to extend you the time. Did, but Go ahead. Why would you say no to something that has no. worked in this city, I'm saying especially that you the are, Toronto Community I'm Housing that, Corporation. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm saying that you are a one trick pony. Just, just finish your last thought, but time is up. All right, I'm saying that you are a one trick pony that says government does everything. Oh, that's and, I'm, and I'm saying that what we have to do is we have to create an environment here in which people from around the world are going to want to come here and create jobs uh, because they find this an attractive place to do business. And no, I would not cancel those things. But, let's but be what I would clear. now, you have no Ms. Plan. Ms. Chow, the next question is for you, and we'll have more of an open debate as we go through here. The second question is for you, Ms. Chow. A newly released report from RBC shows that 81% of people across the GTA, be they downtowners or suburbanites, want to live in a walkable, transit friendly neighborhood. In fact, they'd be willing to live in a smaller home so they could be part of a community served by rapid transit. What will you do to combat gridlock and make accessible transit a reality? And how specifically will you fund that plan? Two minutes to you. Thank you. I have been very clear and honest about how I would build transit in this city. Faster, cheaper, better transit now. The downtown subway relief line, let's start. The LRTs that we've spent four or five years studying, there are three lines, the Finch, the Shepherd and the Scarborough one, let's start the construction now because they're ready. We've even uh, uh, signed a contract with Bombardier to purchase the trains. Let's do it now. And let's invest in bus services so that we can see immediate improvement now. And of course, the province is going to electrify GO trains, so it's a comprehensive model. It is designed by experts and other newspaper like the Star said that it is the best plan of all the candidates. And I'm very honest about 
how we could pay for it, yes, through property taxes, but also through a bit of increases in the land transfer tax, 1% point for those that are purchasing uh, a home uh, or condo that is more than $2 billion. I've been very clear, and I think it's important that my Mr. Tory and Mr. Ford be very clear and, and start being honest to people that we cannot build public transit we cannot improve public transit without actually paying for it. And uh, that's the public transit part. And lastly, on um, the question of better uh, traffic plan, let us ask the construction companies and the developers that are blocking lanes to do construction, give them a graduated fee. The longer they block the street, the more we should charge them. Right now, it's a flat rate. There's no financial incentives for them to open the lane faster. Let's do what Chicago do, and we can do that by uh, asking them to not have a flat rate. And that's a city policy that I would use. That would clear up the traffic a lot faster. Mr. Tory, same question to you. Well, I think we have to start by getting traffic moving. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of public transit vehicles uh, sitting in the very same traffic jams that a lot of people are sitting in and a lot of trucks trying to do business. And I put forward a list of, I think, 10 or 11 or 12 uh, common sense measures, most of them, frankly, drawn from city reports that have been written and not acted on. Things like coordinating the construction. It doesn't take a genius or a lot of high technology to put together a simple spreadsheet that loads into it uh, the Blue Jay schedule, the construction schedule, the marathon race schedule, the TTC repair schedule, and so on, and have some red flags get kicked up when there's things that are going on all at the same time. It doesn't take too much to enforce the law so that you don't have trucks, delivery trucks, and shredding trucks, and all kinds of people parking in lanes of traffic at rush hour, blocking hundreds and hundreds of people from going about their business. The second thing I would address after the traffic, and I, as I say, I can't really list all those measures now that are in my, um, in my platform, but the second thing is address the reliability of the existing service. I can't tell you how many people tell me across the city about sitting on subway trains that are stopped and they don't understand why, or that are waiting for a bus for 12 minutes and then three buses come all at the same time. This is a management problem. And I think we have the skills in place with Mr. Byford to get it done, but if he needs more tools, then we should darn well give them to him so we can have a reliable system. Thirdly, I would build the Scarborough subway. I would build the Scarborough subway. It will be a good long-term investment, and besides which, and importantly, I think, ladies and gentlemen, all three levels of government have agreed it should be a subway and put up their money. And in this country, they hardly agree very often on what day it is, all three levels of government. I'd get on with it, whereas Ms. Chow will reopen that discussion and re-decide it and re-debate it, and we will do what we do so well in this city, which is nothing, because we're sitting around re-deciding and re-debating. I'm going to get on with it. And finally, smart track. Smart track. We should have been building one subway station every year for the last 22 or 25 years, and we haven't done it. This is going to give us a chance to have 22 new transit stations, trains every 15 minutes, by and large on existing GO train tracks. It just makes sense. I'm going to, now, I'm going to allow for two minutes of open debate on the transit issue. Mr. Tory, you're asking people to wait at least 10 years before we see any transit improvement. You wouldn't tell people how many houses, the libraries and the community centers around Eggington and Weston, where your track, uh, the GO train, do a dramatic 90 degree turn. And you wouldn't tell people how many kilometers of tunneling does this track would take. Okay, and so, how much look, money would it take? Because you again, first said that you would not do any tunneling. You said that it does not require any going underground. Now you said that you do, it does. And then you wouldn't say how many kilometers, because last I checked, uh, one kilometer of uh, tunneling is about $300 million. And that $8 billion price tag does not include any tunneling cost. So how many kilometers do you need to tunnel? Uh, and how much extra money would so it Ryan, cost? So, Ryan, I don't want to interrupt so Ms. Chow, and I think that's up, up to you. you uh, she's now used half the time, well, so will I get the other half? Feel free to have the other half. Okay, half no, let me, let me, no, let, she just used half the time, and I'll use the other half, and you'll let me speak. I'd let you speak uninterrupted. So, you tried. I mean, this is what you do. 
And, and you, you try to find all kinds of reasons not to do something and to say, well, you know, this is impossible. There might be some solid rock we'll find. You know what? If it was you building the Young Street subway in the 1950s, when they hit, as they did, a huge patch of solid rock, you'd have given up and just said, it's okay. People can walk down Young Street. They didn't give up. And I'm not going to give up on Smart Track because it's urgent. We've put off doing something for 25 years. This is going to provide 22 new stations of transit in seven years, not the 17 of what, what Ms. Chow talks about, 17 years. She'll tell you about a bus plan. She was alluding to it. Well, ask her how she reconciles what she's saying about that bus plan with the fact that the head of service for the TTC says there are no buses. Uh, do you believe a politician, anyone including me, versus the guy who's in charge of the buses at the TTC? I don't think so. Well, Mrs. Corey, you so. did not answer the question. You noticed you did not say how many kilometers. That, that you is, did that not is answer the questions at all. You both had a minute on that issue. So let's switch to question three. John, this question is for you. In the final meeting of City Council this year, there were motions and debates over issues like regulating energy drinks, e-cigarettes, a call for a national inquiry into missing and murdered Aboriginal women, and a proposal to make the words of the national anthem more gender neutral. In your mind, are these municipal issues, and would you refocus the city's priorities as mayor? Your time starts now. Let me say this. I, I, I wouldn't sort of say, well, all those kinds of things should be excluded. I think City Hall is the sort of the essence. It's the heart of democracy of our city. And there are times when those kinds of things where the city has to have a voice. But I'll tell you what concerns me more, in a way, uh, about that very same meeting. You probably read at that very same meeting that in that one single meeting, they approved 750 stories of new development. Now, I'm not saying this is a bad thing in and of itself, because it shows people want to invest in a city. It shows that we're growing as a city because we have to grow. There's 85,000 people, thank God, coming here from around the world, seeing this as a beacon of opportunity. But I am asking myself, when you were taking the time to have the debates about all those different things that you mentioned, at the same meeting as you were approving 750 stories of new development, were you spending enough time asking the questions, what about schools, what about parks, what about transit, what about hydro, what about sewers, what about recreational facilities, what about libraries? And so I think what we have to do is spend more time focusing on getting people results, because what we do in answering those questions is we ask them, we ask them and then they're often answered by sort of saying, well, we'll deal with that later. And of course, I think what that's ended up creating is a city that's still a great city, but if we want it to stay great, we're going to have to answer, ask and answer those questions at the same time. And I think what people want to see, they'd be happy, I think, Ryan, to see us having all kinds of debates on resolutions about the national anthem and all those other things, if we also, at the same time, produced results. And there got transit, got built, and jobs were attracted to the city. And uh, programs were put in place for kids and families. And affordable housing was getting built. And all those different kinds of things they expect from their city government. But they haven't been seeing that. What they've been seeing, and I think this is the clear choice you have, ladies and gentlemen, is they've been seeing chaos and division, not even because of those resolutions, but because of the leadership style of the Fords. And that's the real question I think people have to answer. Do they want four more years of that chaotic, divisive leadership style or do they want a breath of fresh air at City Hall that gets results? Ms. Chow, Ms. Chow, same question to you. I believe the City of Toronto should have a policy on whether there should be an inquiry for murder and missing Aboriginal women. Absolutely. And I don't shrink from that. In that report, in that final council meeting, it was also a very important item. It talks about, it's from TTC. The TTC, the commission, unanimously said that they want to make sure that the services, whether it's buses or streetcars, can be improved immediately. And there was a massive plan. Mr. Tory said that, well, you know, they shouldn't have approved it. I don't agree. City Council didn't agree. What City Council did was said that we have to restore the bus services and the streetcar services that have been cut in the last four years. Because Mr. Ford, Mayor Ford, stood in front uh, four years ago and said that he would cut the gravy. Instead, what happened when he arrived was that he cut the TDC budget. As a result, TDC fares have gone up. People are waiting longer for their buses and it's more packed like sardines and the people are being left behind. And in this election, neither Mr. Tory nor Mr. Ford would commit 
to invest in TTC's operating budget immediately so that we can reverse those cuts so that we can immediately get improvement. Now, all the schemes that we talked about, that Mr. Tory and Mr. Ford talks about, takes at least 10 years to materialize. What's going to happen in the next 10, 10 years? Whereas my plan was very clear that the LRT construction, for example, can be done by 2020 which is a lot faster than 10 years. So I think it's important that at that council meeting that I am so glad the city council unanimously said that we have to invest in public transit right now, and that's the right way to go. I'm going to open this up now okay. to debate. So let's talk about that report, because I think you've mischaracterized uh, what happened. Uh, in fact, what I said was, this is a report, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that involves a total expenditure and investment of $500 million. What I said was, that report has to go to the Budget Committee, because to me, this is part of the problem in government today. All governments, but including at Toronto City Hall. You can't just put a tick mark, as Olivia will do, beside a report and say, yeah, I'm in favor of that, when it's $500 million without knowing where the money's going to come from. And so I said it should go into the budget process, where they make all of the allocations with the long list of things that people have to decide upon. That's what you're elected to do. And so that's exactly what I said. I didn't say I opposed the report. I said we need to know where the money's going to come from, as opposed to Ms. Chow, who stands here right today and says to you, take it off. I'm in favor well, of that report without having any idea whatsoever as to where the majority of that money well, is going to come from. That is we not true because I you know was very it. clear. I said earlier on the, the land transfer tax, the extra 1% point, right? But Mr. Tory, you are confusing. When you m mention $500 million, you're adding both the operating and capital budget, and it's not just about That's because one year, money is money, but, Olivia. Well, no, it's all but it is, no, pocket. that is not, well, no, we are, the first thing that Mr. Ford did, Mayor Ford, was to cut the operating grants, right? And you went and yesterday you made a promise of $20 million on, on some environmental thing. Actually. On the trees, you, you promised all this money. You made these promises. You didn't say where the money is coming from. I you are not even promising a single penny you know where I of said, improvement. Here's the difference. Let me finish. You are okay. not promising one single penny to go into the public transit area. Let me talk How about, you let me talk, that? Ryan, about the promise. How could you say to well, the people that are left respond. behind? The, the promise I made yesterday was to invest $22 million in smart energy monitoring, real-time energy monitoring uh, equipment to be put in every single city building. We spend $250 million a year money? on energy. Can the savings will be 10%. It'll pay itself back in right. no time. That's that is, where the that money's is, coming from. That it's is smart business. That is time on this segment. And the next question is for Ms. Chow. Ms. Chow? A recent stabbing at North Albion Collegiate left a young man dead and left a lot asking what should be done to prevent this from happening again. Since the murder of Jordan Manners, who was shot at his school in 2007, changes in high schools have included more student supports, breakfast programs, resident police, and security cameras. Do you feel those measures are enough, or can more be done? Ryan, thank you for that excellent question. I was hoping that would come up. At the time when Jordan Manor was killed, I said very clearly that we need to invest more after-school programs and food programs for children. I'm glad we took one step on it, but it's not enough. It has been working because if you look at the youth crime rate, it has dropped. We know that it has dropped, but one murder is one murder too many. So in my plan, I've said that what I would do is to increase after-school activities for children, Hiring young people that are role model in their community, that they can then teach children a skill so that they too can be the role model. And that we've seen it work in many places. We need to expand that so that our children would not become latchkey kids. So they grow up smart and strong and stay out of trouble. We need to do a lot more than that. We also know that when children are hungry, they can't focus. If we provide better food programs for children, and I pledge to make sure that at least 36,000 more children can have good food programs in school, then they can be smarter, they can learn better, they can do better in math and reading and science. We know that. So all of those things, of course, we also need to support the police so that there's a presence in the community. All of those things combined, I am sure we can see a continual decrease of the crime rate in Toronto.
I, since I have 20, I also want to say one more thing. A lot of young men feel picked on if their skin color is black or brown. We need to end racial profiling because that is so important. It hurts the psyche. We need to make them feel that they are not a criminal. So I think we need to stop racial profiling and also stop carding. And that would really help in those communities. John, same question to you. I think uh, all of us in the city find uh, racial profiling uh, unacceptable, and it shouldn't be uh, any part of anything we do anywhere uh, in the city. I, I want to just say that I can't, I can't imagine a more unspeakable tragedy than for a parent um, in, in our city, any parent anywhere, uh, to lose a child in this kind of an incident. And I can't imagine a place where people would find it uh, you know, less likely they would think it would happen in the schools. I think everybody thinks our schools are supposed to be safe. But I think what we have to start on with this more so than anything else is with some honesty. I think that, that you know, my experience in civic action and for years before that up in, in, in these communities talking and more importantly listening to people suggests that we haven't yet been honest about the fact there are pockets in the city and, and not honest about the fact not only that they exist but also that they are populated to a greater extent than, than other places in the city by people whose skin color is not white, is maybe black or brown, or who did come from somewhere else, or who may be more likely to be a single mom and so on. And I think we've got to have an honest discussion about that and recognize as a community that that is a reality and that, th that sometimes those people in those communities are facing struggles that are not the struggles that form part of the record of other people's lives in the city. Then I think it, it is, yes, a matter of government showing some leadership. I think right now what we've got is government uh, showing lots of leadership, but in a very uncoordinated way, where you have governments of all levels, all over the place, doing things that in and of themselves are good, but are uncoordinated and best practices have not been adopted. I think that we have to uh, take that government leadership and use it to engage people. Uh, more so than just people working for the government. We have to engage people in businesses. I think where the opportunities are going to come from for a lot of these young people in particular is in small and medium-sized business where it's been difficult for them to engage themselves and difficult for us to engage them in this task. I've been very much personally involved in doing this as a private citizen for the last number of years. And I think what we've got to do in order to have government be able to provide that role of leadership is, yes, invest city monies from the taxes that we take uh, from commercial and property taxpayers, but also go and get our fair share of the provincial money that's just been allocated for this purpose. That is time and <laughs> is time for open Mr. debate on the issue of school safety. Folks, you would have heard that Mr. Tory have not given any concrete suggestions, whether it is for after school activities and any activities for young people, I think we need to invest. We also need to make sure that parents spend more time with their kids. You, that area is Rexdale. Right now, to get from Rexdale to anywhere takes hours and it is not fair that we would not build the light rapid transit and I'm the only candidate that said that let's start building that light rapid transit right on Finch right now so that those parents all the all the young people that wants to travel let's say from Kiel to uh, to Humber College that they would be able to save half an hour per day then they can, the parents can spend more time with their kids. So, Mr. Tory, why wouldn't you build that light rapid transit right now? Because previously, you said you want to wait till the smart track is done, and that's Again, Chow, 10 years. Allow How, him to answer why not build the LRT Again, right okay, now Okay, so we've had half the time, so I'll, I'll take the other half, that's fair? Okay. So, uh, what I have said, again, you've mischaracterized what I've said, perhaps you didn't understand, but we, we, I, I've said I will build Smart Track. Yes, and I'm going to get on with that right away because it's urgent that we do so. Citywide relief, 22 new transit stations in seven years, and it's going to provide relief for the entire city, get a lot of cars off the road, and do a lot of good connecting people to jobs. And you know that they, that schedule coincides roughly with the schedule of the building of the Finch and Shepherd LRTs, which I said I would proceed with that work. So I am not waiting, and you absolutely know that's not true, what you said. I am not waiting. I'm getting on with both, but I've said my work plan has to be to get in and get Smart Track going because it's a, a newer idea consistent with provincial policy, which is going to electrify the GO train tracks, and I will do both at the same time. I think one of the things we could do that would not contribute to helping traffic or helping families, for that matter, is to pour more people on these new LRTs into the same Young Street subway line that's already overcrowded before we get Smart Track in place at the same time that is going to provide some relief. It just makes sense to me, but I'm not altering the schedule. I'm saying that I would proceed time. with it as scheduled. Uh, 
I'm just going to ask that during the next open portion of debate, you guys can talk to each other if, if you like, and you can have a debate with one another. Just want to encourage that. Uh, John, this question is for you. A form forum research poll of Torontonians conducted last year revealed strong support for council term limits. Some 61% supported a term limit for mayor, and 58% support a term limit for councillors. Do you think there are too many career councillors on council, and would you put an end date on your own term? Well, the answer to that question is that I, is, is, I'm concerned about the same thing because, and I'm concerned about it, frankly, in, uh, in, in the corporate world too. I think that, that uh, if you serve too long in a given position, no matter how smart you are or how good you are, uh, you are no longer going to be as likely to be an agent of change or a person who's, a, who's as, as able to adapt to change because I think uh, human nature is what it is. You get settled in. Um, I can tell you right now, and my wife Barb is sitting here, I think that if I served more than two terms as mayor, I would find myself after that period of time living in a small apartment by myself. Um, <laughs> and that doesn't seem to be a very appealing prospect to me, especially living alone. Um, and so um, I, I think that uh, it, is, it is, I think it is a good thing to have turnover in these jobs from time to time. I think that uh, the public generally make decisions about that in a fairly wise way uh, when they think people have had their, their time and sometimes they do it after four years. Uh, if you ask me, uh, do I, 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 when I was asked this 11 years ago when I ran for mayor, I said no, the voters decide uh, when people come and go from public office and I generally think they're pretty good at that. If you said to me, has my thinking begun to evolve because I've seen people that, I, I think what happens? I think what happens very simply is that people who get settled into their whole life being in public life begin to realize there's probably not much else in some respects they could do and it's not their fault. They're away from teaching or law or computer science or this or that for a long period of time and sometimes you can't go back. But I think there is no question that then begins to affect the way you make decisions because you're concerned about self-preservation in office and I think that's got to be a bad thing. And so I am more open to the discussion and I think we should have a much broader discussion about uh, issues of our democracy and how it works because the public are talking about this too and they're talking by not showing up to vote. That's how they're saying, we don't think this system is working very well. So if you said, am I open to that conversation? Yes. Will I have a term limit imposed on myself by self-imposition? Yes. And if I was uh, slip sliding on that, uh, Barb would make sure that I didn't backslide. Ms. Chelsea, same question to you. I think experience matters. And we're dealing with a $12 billion corporation. Right? And it's a very complex organization. Sometimes it takes a bit of time to have a complete understanding on how this system works. And I've watched some of the councillors, and I'll even name them. If you look at Councillor Pam McConnell, she's been pushing to have a new community centre in St. Jamestown for many years. So a few years ago, she finally got it done. It's not because she didn't try. She tried over and over and over again. It's difficult to get all the funding in place. Okay. And she wanted to revitalize Regent Park. And it took many years. And it took a lot of work, hard work, bringing different people together. And finally, we are now seeing the impact of this revitalization. And we're seeing the jobs being created there. So having experience, having that kind of passion and commitment, some things, especially municipal government, takes quite a while to get accomplished. And I don't believe there should be a term limit. There is no term limit in the federal member of parliament or the provincial uh, arena. Why on municipal government? So I believe experience matter. If people have passion, now, if they stop working out when they are not accomplishing anything, then the voters will then make a decision and say that, ah, you stop being effective, then we won't reelect you. And I've seen councillors Howard Moscow, another one. The kind of work that he did in TDC was phenomenal. And so there are people that you know, they eventually you know, retired. Uh, Mike Feldman, there are a lot of councillors that have done a lot of years and phenomenal work. And I don't believe we should set an arbitrary term limits on them. I will so, open this to actual debate. I think what happens here, though, with these some of the, and I'm not referring to any individuals, that I will refer to, to, to two, but uh, not the ones you talked about, but is that after you've been there for a period of time, yes, you've been around, 
But there also sets in, I believe, in my heart of hearts, a certain sense of entitlement to be there, an entitlement to make these decisions. And I think exhibit one is what you see with the Fords, where they not only think they're entitled to sort of be there, but they can kind of pass the office, these offices around within the family. And I don't think that's right. But I would, I would put this question to you. If experience, if experience is everything, then with all the people that have been there all those years, some of which you did refer to, how come everything's in such a mess today? The traffic's a mess. The transit's not getting done. We don't have the job. All right, the give, affordable housing's not getting built. Let's, if that, if let's it's give all those people that have the been there all those years, how come all those experienced people can't get anything done? We got into a mess because four years ago, we were told that you can get subways by not paying a penny for it. Okay, that's actually what happened. We are seeing it again. Four years later, we have Mr. Ford and Mr. Tory saying, ah, don't worry, we built you something. Subway for one, tracks on the other, and don't worry, you don't have to pay a single penny and somehow it will magically appear. And you know, the voters four years ago so, made a mistake and that's why we are Olivia, in such a mess. How can you, have it, no, how can you have it both ways? On the one hand, five minutes ago, you were intensely critical of the funding tool that I have set out to pay for the transit. And you said it won't work and it hasn't worked here and That's there right. and so on. It's the same now you're saying that I've said subways are free. Or, no, no, or no, it's the same. It's I've the sold same. out how I'd pay for it. You no. don't like it. And, no, and you, because you it hasn't worked it. anywhere you're else. You're pessimistic about that it, and a lot of other things. It hasn't worked in New York. It hasn't worked it's in California. It's worked a million other places and Absolutely it will work not. here because we'll make it work and the city's going to grow and you know it. 89% failure rate in California is not what I numbers. say I works. You make them up. And it's the same it's the same idea, same policy that Mr. Ford used that four is, years ago and that guess is what? Time. It didn't work for him, it won't work for that you. Is, that is time on that segment. Uh, Olivia, this question is for you. Uh, a report this week suggests that Toronto has bucked the national policing trend over the last few years. As other cities have hired more officers, Toronto has seen their police rates decline, while surprisingly, crime in the city has dropped by 41%. Given that fact, do you believe more police officers are the answer to keeping our city safe? No, not more officers. We do need officers, and I thank the men and women that keep our uh, our, our community safe, they serve us and protect us. And, but I don't think we need to increase the number. What we do need to uh, is make sure that there's real community-based policing by bringing the community and the police together. Secondly, we need to have a police that reflect the people they serve. That too is very important. And thirdly, we have to say to the police that their budget is too large. We have to find a way to contain it, especially the overtime budget. We think, I believe, that there should be a less pay duty officer and that if we moved and changed the shift work, that we would be able to lower the number of officers that need to do uh, overtime. And that when we need the officers the most, which is around the time when school get out and from 3.30 to about 5 o'clock, that's the time a lot of crime happen. So we need to make sure that there are officers that are around at that time. But we don't necessarily need to say to them that they should be doing it over time. So there are different ways in working with the police. I've done it before. I've been able to uh, contain the police budget so that we have other funds to invest in children and young people and public transit, for example. I have the experience to deal with the police budget and I also have the courage to say no when the request is not reasonable, but also say yes when it's a smart investment. I pledge to you that's what I'll do with the police and also on the policing uh, relationship with the communities. Mr. Tory, same question. Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to make it very clear, and I've stated it many times before, I would not reduce the size of the police complement, the, the uh, human resource, uh, num the number of police officers. I think, it's, I, think it's, I think it's one of the reasons why the crime rate is down, because 
we've been able to deploy police officers in the community and have police officers on the spot. I think uh, criminals naturally stay away uh, from places where the police are, and police have been able to forge a better relationship. And I think uh, Chief Bill Blair has done a good job. Uh, it's progress, but not enough as yet, but a good job at making progress on making the police service more representative of the community that we live in. But I think we do have to look for better policing. And I would point out to you, when people will declare to you they're going to change the shifts or they're going to change this or they're going to change that, those things are part of a collective agreement that is reached between the Police Association and the Police Services Board. And so those things are not going to be mandated by the Mayor or any member of the Police Services Board. They're going to be negotiated. And I think you're going to have to ask yourself who you want to send in uh, to do that job because those things do have to be done. We do have to change some of those working conditions to to make more effective use of the police officers we have. Less time standing beside construction sites. People tell me about seeing this every day of the week and more time able to actually do real police work that they're trained to do. Less time in court. We need some cooperation from the province on this. There are immense numbers of police officers spending immense hours in court. It's not good productive time. A lot of the time they're just sitting waiting. Those in the room who are, use the courts, uh, for one reason or another, uh, know, know that. Um, but so, so these are the kinds of things we have to do, um, and I think that uh, it, it is something where we're going to have to have the determination to do it and the relationships to do it, uh, because it's going to be a lot of it is going to be a matter of yes being firm, but also having the trust of the different parties involved to make sure it happens, because we do have to constrain the growth uh, in the size of our emergency service budgets, uh, because they are much like healthcare in the provincial scene, uh, taking up an increasing uh, share of limited resources. And that is time on that segment. It is now time for a debate on policing. Well, I've said very clearly that when elected as mayor, I will sit on the police service board. I will work together with other city councillors that are on the board and the appointees from the province and work together to make sure that the policing that we have are community-based. Would you, Mr. Tory, sit on the police service board and do you think the budget is too large? And if, if so, uh, yes, so of course, we need to uh, negotiate with the, uh, uh, the unions. Um, would you actually be involved and give direction to say that the union contract at this point needs to be changed? And what area would you like to change? I let's have, let's have, have him answer the question. The compressed work week is too much, and that's an area that we need to change. Well, uh, to answer your two questions, first of all, I'm not sure uh, whether I would put myself on the police services board or not, and I'm not making a lot of those kinds of decisions uh, before I get elected. I think that may be a bit presumptuous, but having said that, um, I will make that decision. I would hope that when I get there, I would have a better, uh, better soldier in there than you had the last time you were there when you had to resign. But having said that, um, I would like to uh, then get on to the second part of the question, which is with respect to the budget. And it isn't, the mayor, of course, doesn't uh, instruct uh, you know, the police chief or the, or the police services board, I would certainly set out the expectations together with the members of city council and the budget committee as to what we have to do to, I would say, constrain the growth in the police services budget um, and leave it to them and to them in their negotiating process to uh, achieve what we need set out. And I have suggested ways in which I think that can be done. They're really not that much different than what you've said. It's just that I have acknowledged the fact that that's going to have to happen Mr. as Tory, a matter you, of negotiation. You know, let, me, let me address that question. I had the guts to stand up to the police and said that that it is important to de-escalate a situation. You tried had to tell the to police what no, to do at I a riot going on at Queen's Park. stand up against the police service union. You know those are the facts. They're on the, the record. Self, it was a disgrace. You had to resign. Break one well. They were throwing I bottles the, at Queen's I Park the and, and to throwing so, sticks and, I'm and stones sure you do. at people. You know, at, that, because that's why I am you had to resign. It was a wholly inappropriate thing for you to do. And you know it. That's why you resigned. Our time is up in that segment. not true. Thank you. It's part of the history. The second section of today's debate is actually questions from the audience this afternoon that is gathered here, both from Twitter and from email. And we're going to start with the, uh, the first question out. John, this question will be to you. How do you plan to work with the federal and provincial governments to actually get your platform implemented, especially on transit where those commitments are necessary? Well, I think this is a vitally important question because I think one of the things that people are going to be judging when they make their choice uh, on the 27th of October is who do they think, as uh, between and among Mr. Ford, uh, Ms. Chow, and myself, is most likely to be able to get the support and the results we need. And I go back to sort of first principles on this. What we've allowed to happen, and I say we've allowed it to happen as a city, and to some extent the province has allowed it to happen within the country, is that we've allowed the other governments 
to back away from or just stay out of areas that are vital areas of public investment in the country's biggest city, the economic engine of the country, the country that is bound to have the most complex problems because of its size and its diversity and so on. And I think there of things like, not limited to, transit, affordable housing, uh, and infrastructure. And I think what is going to be vital in the four years ahead is who is going to be best able to go and convince them to do what I th think they should do. And the way I articulate it is that we should have in those areas a 10-year contract with them, ideally involving all three levels of government, where instead of this kind of ad hocery that goes on where you never know, and I don't know how if you don't know whether you've got the money you can ever plan anything, you don't know whether they're going to fund this transit project or that one or this affordable housing development or that one or whether they're going to be in on Monday and out on Wednesday. And I think if we have, if, if they have the confidence in us that we have the kind of government administration where we've got our act together and we're acting in a sensible, competent, accountable way, that we have a plan to take forward with respect to transportation and housing and so on, then I think we can convince them to do that. And I think one of the things people are going to be asking is, given we're dealing here with both the Harper majority conservative government in Ottawa and the Wynn majority liberal government at Queen's Park and the city council, which person from among those on offer is most likely to be able to get all of those people to work together, to enter into those agreements, to provide that funding, to actually get results for the people on transit, on housing, on infrastructure, because that's what people want. It's back to the beginning. They want results. Ms. Chow, same question to you. Well, experience matter. When I was a member of parliament, I worked closely with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and Big City Mayor's Caucus to push for the gas tax from the transfer from the federal government to the city. We now have five cents in the permanent transfer of this gas tax. We need more, absolutely. We also said that we need to make sure that it rise with inflation. And that was a year and a half, two years campaign, and we were able to have the gas tax rise with inflation so that we get a bit more predictable long-term funding. We need a lot more, but it's never just being ourselves alone pushing. We need to work with other city mayors, and I have the experience to do so, and I have a record of uh, delivery. One other area in the federal government is that I worked across the aisle with the Minister of the Time of Immigration to crack down on crooked immigration consultants. And we were able to uh, have the bill pass through. And again, you know, the Minister at the Time, uh, in his introduction of the bill, thanked me for the work. In the provincial government, I've also done it. I started a children nutrition program when I was school trustee, expanded it across the city when I became the city councillor. Now it's a provincial program. It is across the province. And the city have now had partnership with the province where the, pro uh, where the provincial government provide funding support on this very excellent program. I've done it before. I know I can do it again. And absolutely experience matter. Now, Mr. Tory said that it's about relationship. It's not just about relationship. If you look at the track record, when he was in Queen's Park, I have not seen anything that was beneficial to the city of Toronto being delivered. And that's not good enough. Track record matters. Results matter. I have the experience to get things done and working with the provincial and the federal government. You will now have... You will now have two minutes to debate the issue of relationships with other levels. One of the elements that I think uh, has been missing today, because uh, there is a person missing, um, is something that I think people really should focus on uh, in this election campaign and when it comes to those kinds of relationships you talked about. Because I think it starts with relationships with the City Council and then goes through there to relationships not only with the other governments, but also with the business community, uh, with unions, uh, with uh, non-profit groups and so on. Uh, we have in Doug Ford a person who referred not long ago uh, to the city councillors as monkeys. Uh, he indicated his desire was so strong to have the mayor's job, which he wasn't seeking at the time, that he said the sooner he could get out of town and go to Chicago and do his business, the better. Now he's a candidate for mayor. He told the premier of this province uh, to grow up. I don't really think that kind of approach is going to work very well when it comes to dealing with what you talked about. And I think people have a clear choice in this election because they know in their heart of hearts, I think, that we've got to get those governments, we've got to get the city council working together, bring them together, we've got to get those other governments on side and all the other players, and that the kind of approach that calls people monkeys and tells premiers to grow up is just, just not going to work. Step in, in here. In, you can have the other no. minute, Olivia. Right, I have the other minute. Uh, <laughs> Satori, 
When you had your best chance, when you were the leader of the Conservative Party at Queen's Park, you said that the provincial liberal budget was too Toronto-centric, that in fact Toronto was receiving too much money. We're friends like this, who needs our enemies, right? And also, when you had a chance, you said that in your election platform, that you want to ship 5,000 jobs, 10% of the jobs, to outside Toronto. That's 5,000 jobs. You want to ship it out there because you think that other small municipalities should benefit. You know, when you have shown in the past, when you have the position of power, when you are able to be at Queen's Park, over and over again, you didn't deliver any results for Toronto. You did not stand up for Toronto. And that is your track record. I've consistently stand up for this city. That's what we need that is, as a mayor. That is time, Ms. Chuck. Uh, our second question from the audience this afternoon is, and this is directed to Olivia Chow. What will you do as mayor to promote the financially strapped arts in this city? And they give some examples here, visual art, dance, music, Canadian books, and films. That's an excellent question. Uh, as a visual artist, I've always thought that the arts give us a sense of identity, it bring us together, it lifts us up, and it allows us to see the world and our city in a different place. It also allowed us from, as we are from many different parts of the world, all living together in harmony. It allows us to bring all our culture and heritage together and connect with each other and create something beautiful and new. That's what arts can do. And I've always supported the arts. And in this election, I pledge that we would increase the Toronto Arts funding to $25 per capita. We are way behind in Montreal. Montreal is $55 per capita. And the money what we can have is through the funds that people that put up the billboard, that if that billboard funds can just rise with inflation, and that would produce the funds for uh, increasing the grants in the Toronto Arts Council. I would also appoint, a, a start a commission, a Mayor's Commission for Public Art. There are a lot of very, very generous donors that want to purchase art. And this art can then be put into public space, whether it is parks or revenue. We can then take that uh, beautiful sculpture, we can put it in these parks and able to also provide some uh, enjoyment for the people. It's good for the donor, it's also good for the city. And lastly, I believe we need to make sure that no matter which neighborhoods can participate and that there are a lot of artists that cannot afford to live in this city or in an area that they want. So we need to spread the art outside to as many areas as possible to all across the city and make sure that artists have enough funds themselves and a place affordable that to is, live. That is time. Mr. Thank Tory, you. question to you. Well, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm very committed uh, to this sector, both because I think it's an important sector for us to be able to express ourselves, and I think it brings us together in many respects, and also it's a huge industry. It's a huge industry. If you add up all of the different jobs that exist in all the different uh, aspects of the arts and cultural industries across the city. So I think there are a number of reasons to, uh, to be very supportive of it. I think, uh, one, and by the way, I mean, I think the $25 target is getting close to being achieved. It's helped along uh, by the existence now of the billboard tax that was put in place, and I think it will get us there, but I have said uh, in my own uh, arts and culture platform uh, that uh, I'm willing to look at other ways to uh, move us uh, there, and then to move beyond that, because in fact, while we've been waiting, I think the, the $25 target was set uh, when I was running for mayor 11 years ago, and only just now are we getting close, and meantime, as Olivia said, uh, some of the other cities have moved to much higher targets, including Montreal and others. Uh, I think part of what we're going to have to do in order to, um, to both find these sources of funding and also to sort of take full advantage of this in every respect is to, correct, uh, to connect the creative economy to the creative sector. And I think that's going to be an effort we're going to have to make because the two are very much interlinked in terms of the economy of the city. I've said I would establish a music office. Uh, music, as film uh, did uh, 25 years ago, represents a huge opportunity for us to grow. We have a huge embedded music production and performance music talent base here. 
But what we now have to do is turn ourselves into Music City um, because Calgary's out there saying they're going to do it. And the last thing we want to do, because there's a lot that goes with that in terms of, of, of again, uh, both cultural activity but also economic activity. I think we have to look at spaces for artists. I mean, there are... Um, there, there are just not the spaces now where a lot of artists can do their work. We have all kinds of vacant storefronts. We've seen them in different places now that with the ebb and flow of the economy, we now give a rebate to people to uh, take account of the fact those stores are vacant. We should be looking at better, more creative ways, including with the arts, to uh, deploy that. And, and last but not least, I'm a big supporter of the Block by Block uh, local arts initiative undertaken by the Toronto Arts Council, which uh, tries to help um, uh, take art to be more local. That, in other words, encourage grassroots arts. That is time on that issue. You will now have two minutes to debate the issue of this culture funding. Well, I talked about uh, finding space for artists, whether through Artscape, which is a very successful organization, that we can provide some support for art space, that if there are space that, are, that uh, the city, Toronto, have, that we can use some of those empty places so Artscape can establish. Um, and I worked very closely with them right at the beginning when they were looking for a space and at the time I was a city councillor I said to Artscape that with one dollar a year that they would be able to use the Gibraltar Point which is the old island school and from there they were able to establish one of the first uh, artist uh, places where they could uh, practice. We need to do a lot more of that and we also need to create some affordable housing because artists, by and large, are not, to, in terms of their income level, is quite low. So I would pledge to create some affordable housing. Mr. Tory, housing. I'll, I will give you the awesome. next 60 seconds. Sure, I, I don't think you're going to find there's a huge uh, debate. I think we're both people who have a track record and I certainly have had a keen personal interest in this as a volunteer, whether it's with uh, a whole bunch of different organizations, the Film Festival itself, the Canadian Art Foundation, uh, Barb, my wife, I'm proud to say, has been the Vice Chair of the Canadian Stage. I think we have been people who have been, who've been in, not only involved in this, because I think involvement as a private citizen tells you a lot about somebody's uh, you know, somebody's interest in this, but also, um, you know, I, I have been an advocate for it. And I think uh, what we need to do is, yes, find the tools that are going to help the arts community uh, through the grants program and otherwise to to be stronger and to make more of an investment and to link together the creative economy with the creative sector, but also to, to have the government not be an obstacle. The film industry has been helped immensely by the fact there is somebody whose responsibility it is to get the government out of the way wherever it can and, and allow people to get on with the business of making films which employs all kinds of creative people. We haven't been so good in a lot of the other areas where there are obstacles put in people's way and I think that that's part of the music office mandate and I think we've got to have the whole government understand this is an important industry and it's an important part of who we are that is, and get the government out of the way. That is time. Uh, this will be our final question before closing statements and again this comes from the audience this afternoon. A lot has been made about the divide between Toronto's downtown core and bordering regions like Etobicoke and Scarborough, with some feeling that this city has been fractured. Are these parts of the city really that different, and how would you bridge the perceived divide? And John, you start this question. Well, I think one of, the, one of the great, it is actually a privilege to run for public office. People write these articles about all, we, we're, we're out, uh, the two of us often out debating more often than others, but having said all that, um, <laughs> we're out doing this, but it is actually a joy. And part of the joy is not that just, that just you meet thousands of people, but that you also get to see every nook and cranny of the city. And yes, areas of the city within you know, the city of Toronto, within Scarborough, within Etobicoke and so on are very different. But at the same time, I think people are getting more cognizant of the fact that we are one city. The amalgamation debate was a long time ago, and people sort of remember it, and they have some certain, certain resent, resentments about the outcome. But in the end, I think they know we're one city now. But I think that we have to work at that. And, and I think it starts with leadership. And again, I draw the contrast to you of the style that has been deliberately employed by Doug and Rob Ford, where they deliberately, as recently as yesterday, you know, kind of encouraged dissent and resentment between downtown and some other part of the city. That's got to stop. That's got to stop. I have said, you know, I mean, even look at his answer with respect to the Pride Parade. It's the same thing. You know, what possible reason could he have as a person who's being asked in his capacity of the leader of the city as to why he wouldn't march in the Pride Parade? And he gave one of, one of those answers that was kind of some of my best friends are gay answers where he sort of said, well, you know, I write them a check and I go down there and kind of hang around on the sidewalk and watch it. And, and we asked him the question, no, no, you're the leader of the city, you're the leader for everybody. So I think it starts with that. I have one other idea I'll, I'll, I'll mention in the, in the time left to me. 
I would actually take the city council over the course of a year out to each of the old constituent municipalities once a year and have an informal meeting. I think there are impediments that stand in the way of a formal meeting, including technology, where they would actually listen to people from that part of town and then go out in the afternoon and see things in that part of town. See the Scarborough General Hospital where they have 1967 operating rooms. It's not a civic responsibility, but people from Etobicoke should know about that because we don't accept that kind of thing. So those are some of the kinds of thoughts I have on that. That is time. Ms. Chow? Ms. Chow, same question to you. Well, Mr. Tory have said that he, they really disagree with Mr. Ford, both Fords. Well, he donated to Mr. Doug Ford's election campaign and then Mr. Rob Ford's campaign. So I don't know, uh, but your policy, both Mr. Ford and Mr. Tory's policy are leaving entire neighborhood behind. If you think about what is happening in our city, we have more than, well, almost one out of three kids living in poverty. That's 29%. And it has grown in the last four years. And by and large, a lot of them live in the inner suburbs. These are the neighborhoods that need a crying out for assistance, and they need help right now. That's why I said that every person counts. We need to start investing what matters most to them. Buses, light rapid transit within four or five years, food for their kids when the kids go to school, after school programs for their children, good jobs for their young people so they have a sense of hope, that they don't feel that they are trapped in a cycle of poverty, because many of them do feel that way. And I am the only candidate in this election talking about those neighborhoods that have been left behind. I have concrete proposals, specific ideas, and yet we have not heard anything, any investment, any ideas, specific targets on how to deal with those areas that are being left behind. And that is not fair. That's not the kind of city we have. It shouldn't be. They have been left behind for four years already. It's enough. It's time we invest in them. It's time that we create a much fairer, more caring city, a better city for everyone, no matter which neighborhood they live in. It's now time for two minutes to debate this issue. Well, I mean, I've referred today, while we've been standing here, to uh, investing in programs for kids and families, and, and we've talked a lot today about transit. You and I have, you know, some different ideas on that, and I, I think that, um, you know, there are some, some big holes um, in, in what we've talked about in terms of what you say about bringing transit right now. I mean, I even have, and I can pull it out, but I won't waste the time. I could pull it out and read it to you. You've said over and over again about how you're going to deliver things right now, and yet, and yet yes. on an interview with Matt Galloway, he, by the way, Matt Galloway, CBC, and not involved in this election campaign, not partisan, described w what you were talking about in terms of how you would finance your transit as he said, isn't this some kind of a shell game? That's what he said to you. But uh, Mr. Tory, he, he actually said your plan have failed everywhere else in terms of transit well, plan, you can show transit me the transcript. funding. He actually have, said that very clearly. And they said, well, he asked you several questions which you would not answer. I recall that interview very clearly. It was a good four minutes of interchange about your transit plan, your transit funding plan, which is identical to Mr. Ford, which is saying that let's borrow billions of dollars for the downtown subway relief line. Let's borrow billions of dollars for this track. And somehow, somewhere, sometime later, it will, that money will materialize. Well, look, you and I, I know it doesn't work. Just address that. Yep. Because in the end, the tax increment financing, which has worked in many places uh, around North America, has been successful, is founded on the notion that the city is going to grow. In the last 13 years, this city attracted, thank goodness, $32 billion in uh, development. $25 billion residential, $7 billion commercial. That included three or four years that were in the deepest recession since the Great De uh, Depression of 1930, the 1930s. So if you ask me, do I have the confidence that we are going to get the investment and that I'm going to, as mayor, lead a government with the other governments to go and get it and make sure it comes here so that a small portion of the revenue coming from that uh, development that is going to be built B along Smart Track is Tor going to come? Mr. Yes, Tor I do. And what I can tell you Smart Track will be built without increasing property What is the plan B if it taxes. doesn't work? What are you going to do? That is How time on that segment. It? It, is, it is time for closing statements. Olivia Chow, you'll have two minutes to present yours. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. 
Our city is at a crossroad, and you have a major decision to make on how to improve public transit and cut gridlock. I have the plans and the know-how to get people moving faster and sooner. Not in 10 years from now, but right now. We have a clear choice. The other two candidates want to continue the policies that have left huge number of people and neighborhoods behind. With me as your mayor, everyone counts. You will see investment in people right now, especially those that need it the most. The problem with elections is often the truth gets hidden. You need to know the complete truth. But just there are too many questions that Mr. Tory would not answer. How many homes will have to be torn down to build Mr. Tory's transit scheme? What residents and what would they do when Mr. Tory bulldozes over their neighborhood? Because it will happen under his plan. And how much tunneling? How many kilometers of tunneling? We're talking about 12 kilometers of heavy rail that have to go underground. Is that what our plan is? That's $300 million per kilometer. And what, how much more money would we have to pay? And there is no plan B. If it fails, what are we going to do? So I think it's important that Mr. Tory start being honest about how his financial scheme would work. So our city needs a mayor whose plan is real, who knows the specific, and have a track record to deliver the results. I am that mayor. And I'm looking for your vote so we can start building a better city, a more caring city right now. Join with me, elect me as your new mayor. Thank you so much. Mr. Tory, two minutes for your closing remarks as well. Like most of you, and I do want to thank you for your attention today, like most of you, I love this city. It's a remarkable place if you think about it. All of the objective rankings take this city that's not the oldest and it's not the biggest and we rank consistently in the lists everywhere, high up on the list of those cities that are livable and great places to do business. And it's a devotion to the city and to that quality of life that, and to our values as Torontonians and as Canadians that caused me to decide to run for mayor. Yes, I think that a competent, collaborative, uh, accountable approach to the leadership of the city was very much needed and is very much needed after four long years of division and chaos at Toronto City Hall. I think if we don't resolve that issue and go back to something that is competent and reliable and stable and sensible, that we run the risk of doing real damage to the city, both its economic prospects and its reputation, but also its social and political fabric. I think people are yearning for results more so than demanding them. They're yearning for them because they know in their heart of hearts that what's been going on with all the division and the chaos is stopping us from being as great as we can be. They know that it's stopping us from building that stronger, fairer Toronto that we all want. I know how to get those results on transit. Yes, being bold and with a sense of urgency to do something big, but I think that's what we have to do. On traffic, using common sense to move quickly to make things better. On jobs, to sell, sell, and actually know how to do it and how to attract those jobs. And I will work with the council and with those other levels of government because I know that's what you have to do to get things done. I, was say, I said I was running uh, for this job uh, out of devotion for the city, and you know, I've been out there for the past eight months, as has Olivia, earning, earning, your, I hope, your trust each and every day, because I think people have to, have to see a candidates earning the trust of somebody who wants to be their leader. I'm 60 years old. I don't look at having this job as a stepping stone to anything else. I want to go down there and perform public service, which is what it's supposed to be all about, to build a city that's going to go from good to great in the coming years, and I hope I can have your support. Thank that you. is time. I would, just like to, I would just like to personally thank both Ms. Chow and Mr. Tory for taking the time to debate the issues. So we appreciate it, and we appreciate you taking the time out of your afternoon today. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Good job. Done well. Thank you very much to our candidates and to you, Ryan Doyle. That was excellent. Um, please welcome Ted Griffith. Ted is the Empire Club First Vice President and our President-elect. Uh, Ted will thank our guests. Thank you very much, Andrea. Thank you, uh, Mr. Tory, Ms. Chow. Um, this has been a very uh, incredible day for us at the Empire Club. I want to 
Uh, a couple people to thank, in, in addition to uh, our uh, debaters, speakers. Uh, uh, you know, the change we went through this morning, uh, very late, uh, required more than just the removal of a podium and one place at uh, the lunch table. And I want to thank our staff, Jahan and Jenna and the volunteers for the incredible job they did. Um, I also am glad I'm not the president of the Empire Club at this particular time, as uh, my colleague Andrea had to do a, uh, a major bit of media relations work uh, and speaking for the club and with all the work that again. So thank you very much, Andrea, for doing that. Um, uh, what I would like to do is, is thank our, our guests for their debate today. <laughs> I think at the table I heard uh, uh, Mr. John saying about 31 debates so far. Uh, I think that's, uh, we take that for granted in Toronto. I wish we had that same kind of uh, political discourse and debate at the federal and the provincial level. I think we all do better for it. I know it's tough on the candidates and I thank you for, for being here. Um, I have as for you each a gift and that is a copy of our Red Book, this one from 2010-2011. It's a very special Red Book, and I'll tell you why in just a second. The, uh, but our Red Book, we publish it every season, and is a record of every word spoken at the club, and it is delivered to every library, public library in Canada, every consulate, every embassy, across, the Canadian embassy around the world. Uh, we, this is the official record of everything that is spoken at the Empire Club, and we have produced this every year since 1903. Um, so I have a copy of this. First of all, you will get also copies next year because this debate will be in this book. So every word you said is actually written down and be handed to you. And of course, one of you will be, is, one of you is highly likely to be mayor at this point. So you'll be able to uh, look back on that. And we also hope you come back as mayor, should you be elected as mayor, and speak to the club again. Um, there's a very important speech in here. Very important speech. It's on page 24. It's where a certain candidate for mayor, uh, a Mr. Councillor Rob Ford, uh, spoke at the club on September 28, 2010, in his run for mayor. Um, so I think it's very important that you have these words to uh, carry you forward uh, in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ted. I'd like to extend a few final thanks before you all head on your way. Uh, first of all, thank you to our generous sponsors. Our event sponsor today was Accenture. Thank you. Uh, our VIP reception sponsor is Campbell Strategies. I would also like to thank the National Post as our print media sponsor and Van Valkenburg for providing our AV. Uh, please follow us on Twitter at Empire underscore Club and visit us online at www empireclub.org. Thank you all for coming. We hope to see you again soon at some of the exciting upcoming events that are advertised in the brochure that's on your table. So thank you all and we'll see you soon.